All righty. I think we're going to go get started here. looks like we have most people trickling in right now. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Jordan Guerrero. I'm with ASLA New York, and I am a board member and co-chair for the Programs Committee. I'm super excited to have all of you on today for our four CEUs lecture. This is the second of a two-night series for soils as an essential resource. We had a great panel last week. We had Tim Crawl, Chris Siciliano, and Laura Solano. So today to continue the conversation, we have some great soil superstars coming out here. We have James Urban, Tatiana Morin, and Paul Josie, who all represent very interesting and unique perspectives on soils. So just a little bit of housekeeping for all of you who are looking to get your CEU credits. Uh, around the end of the presentation near the Q&A, we're gonna be posting the course evaluation, and we're also going to be posting the quiz. Quiz is not supposed to trick you. It's supposed to be simple questions just to see if you're more or less following along here. So you're going to have to answer both the evaluation and the quiz in order to get your credits. Additionally, if you're seeking ISA credits, we are applying for those. Those are going to take a couple extra weeks. But if you could please email Executive Director Diane Katz with your uh, ISA member number, and she'll be sure to apply and try and get you those credits as well. Uh, this program right now will be recorded, and you can expect to see that recording come up in the next week or so probably on the ASLA New York YouTube channel. Um, in addition to the speakers that we have, we also have our moderator for this evening, Nelsa Nelson Villarubia of Trees of New York, and he's going to be bringing together some really good interesting questions for everyone. Let me get to the next slide. And just before we begin, uh, a little word from our sponsors. We have some great sponsors for this event who were able to make this possible. Not only the event, but gathering all the speakers, getting all of us together, and the happy hour that we're all excited to share together at the end of this too. Our first speaker, or our first sponsor is Bartlett, Bartlett Tree Experts. Uh, Bartlett has been around since 1907, I looked up, and they're a major, major resource for any kind of um, arborism. Okay. Our other sponsor is Deep Root. Um, special thank you to Al Key in helping organize this. So big thank you to Deep Root. And I'm sure you're all familiar with Silva Cells and the products that they have. And last but not least, um, thank you to Trees of New York and specifically our moderator from Trees of New York for coming out tonight. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and get started now with our first speaker. So I'd like to present for all of you, James Urban. James, take it away. Hey, um... So is it, uh, you have to, um, I can't share my screen while others are participating in sharing. So we have to turn something off. There we go, got it. Uh, I think that's what we want. And uh, there we go. Okay, 
So uh, welcome everybody. Um, it's a great pleasure to, to be here um, if we can't all be together. Um, I decided I would call this talk, uh, Science is Not Truth, It's Moving Away from Falsehood. Very interesting statement that was attributed to Albert Einstein in a NOVA uh, program about his uh, life. Um, and interestingly, I cannot find any accurate references that that prove that this is an Einstein quote, in spite of the fact that he is one of the, the most uh, documented people for quotes uh, that we have. Um, and it, it sheds a little bit of light on, you know, how much can we trust um, the information that we get? Uh, and even if it sounds good, is it, is it all completely true? Um, so landscape architecture as a profession, we must challenge an extremely thin scientific foundation uh, that we rest on um, as we advance toward uh, that truth, a truth you'll never get to. Um, and there's, we also all have to fight a peculiar human trait, which is once we have an idea of what is true, we tend to listen to things that support that idea and reject anything that does not. Um, and we certainly see that in the political divide in this country. Um, uh, but it, it, it affects all of us. No matter how open-minded you are, uh, you're still subject to this particular uh, human concept. Uh, now, there we go. Um, so we're going to be talking about uh, some of the research into sand-based manufactured soils. Um, uh, I think I'm correct that uh, the word horticultural soils is a new branding, maybe, of uh, uh, manufactured soils, but maybe it's not. Um, and talk about some of the history of how we, we got to where we are and where we might be able to go um, in the future. Um, so I've set this talk up with a series of theses um, uh, that are uh, that I think we, we need to answer. Um, but I pose them as, as a thesis question, not really as a question, but as, as a, a statement. Um, so I'm going to start by saying we're overly focused on how bad urban soils are rather than embracing the good qualities of urban soils. Um, and that this has driven our profession to move toward uh, manufactured soils. Um, but in fact, urban soils can support really massive trees. Um, and you look at this bottom photo and you see this pile of, 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 it's hard to even find the soil in there, but there are lots of trees growing out of this uh, dump pile. Um, so the fact that all this other stuff that you see is there is having really no effect on the fact that we want to grow trees. So um, the um, I kind of get this off. So, I can, here we go. so my thesis is that the evolution of manufactured soils has not been supported by research, um, and I would like to know what was the problem we were trying to solve in 1976 uh, when we started this. Um, so we. In the 1930s, um, there are two um, very good examples of roof gardens that used unscreened, locally available topsoils. Um, Derry and Tom's department store in the UK, Rockefeller Center Gardens, and there are acres of gardens up there, um, which just have whatever particular soil could be uh, hauled to the site and not a lot of care. And both of those projects um, uh, looked quite well. Uh, I visited Rockefeller Center Gardens uh, on an ASLA tour in the 1980s, um, and they had pulled all the maintenance off of all the gardens except for the, fr the, the front garden, um, the front two gardens on top of the lower buildings. Um, and all the, the roof gardens were full of plants. I mean, the plants were growing quite well, the irrigation had been turned off, the maintenance had, had uh, stopped and it completely populated itself with a beautiful collection of plants. Um, in the 1950s, the University of California started some research on, into potting soil for uh, nurseries. Um, and in the, 19, by, in the 1960s, um, some roof gardens were starting to use what was called UC soil, 
Um, and we were beginning, it was also the beginning of the uh, Golf Greens construction manuals, um, which was based on some research that the golf industry was doing. Um, in 1968, um, uh, Off the Board Into the Ground was published, um, and the, the specification in that uh, book was all topsoil, just bring in whatever kind of um, whatever would pass for topsoil during those days. Um, in 1971, in the UK, they published the Handbook of Urban Landscapes, um, and their specification for soils was still a sandy loam uh, topsoil. In the 1970s, uh, sand-based soils started to appear in the, in the golf industry research. Um, and uh, in 1976, ASLA published uh, the Handbook of Landscape Construction. And this is the first printed reference that I can find within uh, our profession for a, what ultimately became a manufactured soil of 25% topsoil, 50% coarse sand, and 25% peat. Um, and, uh, and I can find no research that was done uh, to uh, support that. It just sort of appeared. Um, and during the late 70s, I began, began to be involved in this. And um, uh, I started writing specifications for uh, manufactured soil based on nothing. We were just talking to people. There was no research. Um, and many of the specifications that I wrote in the 1970s, I still find threads and pieces of those uh, throughout uh, the specification industry. So the next thesis is that if we increase the amount of unscreened loam soils in our soil mix, it will improve plant performance and is actually more sustainable. Um, I only have a small amount of research to support that thesis. It needs to be um, worked on. Uh, the second question in this thesis is that unscreened natural soils outperform engineered or manufactured horticultural soils. And I'll be showing a fair amount of research that supports that statement. And remember, in science, a thesis never gets proven. There's always room for additional investigation. And I think that we're, we need a lot of additional investigation. OK, the next thesis is that we, meaning landscape architects, are overly focused on compost quality. Uh, we put too much compost. Um, in our soil mixes, particularly deep soil mixes. And as a profession, we confuse soil organic matter and compost. Um, and this is a really important thing to um, understand um, in, in the process of specifying and approving soils, the difference between compost and soil organic matter. So compost is simply decomposing material. Um, and the, the compost that we buy, which is typically, say, uh, three or six months old compost, maybe a year old compost, is the first tiny step in a 50 year or longer process uh, to change compost into soil organic matter. So we're only at the first step. Um, much of, of the carbon um, is lost to the atmosphere as CO2. Uh, which is a greenhouse gas. So if you take that big pile of, of two tons of wood parts, yard waste trimmings, uh, whatever it is you've got there, you start out with two tons. After six months, you end up with one ton of compost and one ton of CO2 has gone up into the atmosphere. Um, so that we need to calculate that into our sustainability uh, quotients. Um, and in um, our soil mixes, um, compost pieces are, and soil peds and pieces of soil are separated in, in the matrix. They're floating around, um, not really in, totally integrated with each other. And because compost holds a lot of water, um, uh, it, we may be putting uh, too many of these small sponges um, into the, the soil. And I'm finding that if we get our compost more than 5% by, by dry weight um, uh, in the 
um, uh, our mixes, we're, um, we're starting to have uh, water, too much water in, in our so soils if we over irrigate or we're a really wet area. Um, and then finally on this compost, uh, people say, well, I, I want my, my compost to be um, three, I want my soil mix to have a, a tested um, uh, organic matter of say 5%. Um, well, 10% compost equals 1% to 1.5% of soil organic matter by dry weight. So it's, it, 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 you lose an awful lot of, of uh, volume based on the way we actually test the soil. So we, we, we need to understand that once, if, we, if you want to hold your, your compost between 5 and 10%, um, at 10%, you're only increasing your soil organic matter in the mix uh, by 1.5%. Um, you can see you're never going to get all of that um, good soil organic matter by adding compost. So on the other hand, soil organic matter is a stable compound. It's not continuing to decompose. Um, it's not floating around. It's actually coating soil particles. It's the material that sticks these soil particles together and begin to create structure. Um, and SOM, the soil organic matter, is why our topsoils are black um, and brown. It's that color coming off of that carbon. Okay, my next thesis is that we are overly focused on compaction in our soils um, at the expenses of other, expense of other soil properties. Um, and that deep compaction has different modification requirements uh, than surface compaction. And a good example of this is the grass, the turf panels in the National Mall, which I worked on. Um, and there have been numerous small studies since the 1940s uh, trying to figure out how to make better turf. Um, and every one of them measured and found severe compaction in the soil. They just said it's severely compacted. But if you read deep into each of these reports, you find that nobody measured compaction below six inches. Um, and when I started on this project, I looked at this photograph uh, that we see here, the kind of Google photograph. And I noticed that all uh, the vast majority of the poor turf conditions that you see are actually perfect rectangles overlapping each other. Um, and those are the tents and the event stages and other things that happen on the mall. Um, and they're not really responding to compaction. It's just the the, the, these objects that get, were kept getting put on the mall would keep sunlight from getting to the grass. The grass would die or, or be severely set back. Um, and the Park Service didn't do a very good job of, of rebuilding uh, the, the turf. Um, and since there was a general compaction everywhere, they just assumed uh, that it was compaction. Um, I, when I started this project, I did 25 deep uh, soil profiles um, in 2010. And I found that there was actually very little compaction in the mall below six inches, uh, which said, you know, compaction, uh, long-term compaction was not really the problem. Um, it was just surface compaction, which is much easier uh, to deal with. So we uh, carried on with our mall turf project. Uh, we decided to use a high sand, uh, uh, turf soil, um, because this was a high use lawn area, certainly one of the highest use lawn areas in, in the country, um, with over 2,000 permitted events a year um, on, on various parts of the mall. Uh, so the mall was divided into two phases, phase one uh, on the, the right and phase two on the left. Um, uh, with, uh, I think with 7th Street divides between the two phases. And you can see a sharp color difference between those two phases. Um, in phase one, I tried to push to use the existing soil um, on the mall and mix some amount of sand in it to uh, bring it up to what we thought would work. Um, during the various project, the sand kept getting higher and higher. 
uh, was much higher than I wanted, but, I, but that's what we built. And phase one turf is green, it looks pretty good. Uh, in phase two, um, they did, in phase one, they did have a problem with um, a lot of uh, fungus in getting into the grass because they had irrigated so much because there was so much uh, uh, sand. So in phase two, um, I was not invited back. Uh, a different soil consultant uh, came in and said the reason why we're not able to get the, the turf to be perfect is because we don't have enough sand in the soil. So they put even more sand in and you can see the result and the color. Um, it takes huge amounts of water, huge amounts of fertilizer to keep both those looking good and almost impossible to keep the phase two uh, looking the way they would like it. Ironically, around the edges of the panels on either side is basically the natural sandy loam soil that Olmsted Jr. Uh, brought in from uh, Prince George's County, uh, spread it around. Uh, uh, and those grass panels, except the ones that they were running the um, uh, folk life festivals in, uh, the turf looks much better, both in this aerial photograph um, and in the when you get down on the ground. Uh, so just native soil in this really high use area outperforming the high uh, sand, high use lawn area uh, concepts. So, the next thesis is that from my observations, trees in loam soil grow better than in sand soils. Um, and there's a fair amount of research um, on that. Uh, these are uh, uh, six or no, five of the, the studies. Um, and when you look at them all, they're, they're pretty convincing. Some of these are looking at manufactured sand soils. Some of them are looking at sand-based structural soils. Um, but in all cases, um, a good old loam soil, unscreened, uh, seems to be uh, the winner in all of these different research projects. Um, something that came up in the last uh, session was that uh, uh, vehicle, uh, vibrations from vehicles um, and equipment is impacting um, uh, the landscapes adjacent to uh, the roads. Um, and that was why we would need to use manufactured soils. Uh, there, um, so my thesis is that vibration from vehicles does not impact adjacent soils. Um, I found two um, research projects uh, uh, that looked at this issue. Uh, the first by Linda Cocker Scott in, at Washington State University. And she is the known, in, at least in the ISA, as the queen of myth busting. She takes these ideas and, and really tears them apart and comes up with documented um, answers. And she said, it's just simply not true. Uh, the vibrations do not cause adjacent, uh, any problems with the adjacent soils. Um, but then I thought, well, she's working from the plant perspective. Um, I did find that the Ministry of Transportation in Ontario um, did a, a study to look at mitigation of highway tr uh, traffic induced vibration. Um, and these are now engineers uh, looking at this and they're checking to see if there's any plaster cracking or noticeable damage to adjacent residential built buildings, meaning uh, uh, stick built, uh, small light construction. And they said, it's mostly not true. Uh, we didn't find, there. they had six levels of damage um, that they were, were looking at. And only in the most extreme circumstances uh, by both vibration um, and soil types did they find any minor damage to any of these buildings. Um, so uh, we don't need to really worry about vibration. Um, Another one that's crept into our specifications, and I probably admit that I think I wrote that one, this, this one, uh, that the soil should be free of all sorts of things that harm plants. Uh, my new thesis is that there's no need to require a soil to be free of all sorts of things that do not harm plants. And examples would be construction debris, rocks, roots, clumps of subsoil of heavy clay, um, um, other, other things that creep into our soils. Um, and so I, I felt that it would probably not be good for us to have a specification 
that said uh, you can allow as much as you want, and then you ended up with that first picture that I showed you. So I, I have inserted the term reasonably free of, um, which the word reasonably does appear in other spe specification uh, uh, sentences, um, so that the total volume of non-soil material uh, should not exceed 15%. And I might even uh, go to 20% that, that, uh, as where we might have bricks and bones and roots and uh, other objects. Um, and the picture you see at the bottom um, is at the Supreme Court of the United States. You think that'd be a pretty uh, high-end project. Um, we, I found a great source of, of soil being uh, excavated from a construction site. Um, it was beautiful soil, but had a lot of debris in it. Uh, I convinced the uh, Smithsonian or the, the Supreme Court to um, uh, allow these objects um, in the soil with the caveat that if any of it ended up on the surface after grading, the contractor would pick them up and throw them away. Um, and here is these gardens uh, by Roadside Harwell, uh, looking fabulous just four years um, after construction in this beautiful unscreened uh, loam topsoil. Oh, and I did need to mention that um, we also have the spec section that we that, uh, that the soil shall be free of weed seeds of various kinds. And it's absolutely impossible to find a soil that is free of anything. Uh, it's too varied a project. Um, so I have inserted as a thesis that the sentence should read reasonably free of weed seeds um, and that the contractor should remove any weed plants that sprout the soil over the first two years um, and that should take care of any kind of weed problems that you have. But it's a really dumb idea to have a requirement in the specification that can't be met. So if you say free of, that means it's zero and you never get to zero. So you have to define something above zero as a limitation um, in your specification. So if we're going to use these native soils, um, particularly if we want to use um, the existing soils at the site, um, often, so, sometimes we're doing massive grading, but often, especially in smaller projects, we might not. Uh, what would be a, a good way of treating these existing soils? So Susan Day, uh, when she was at uh, uh, Virginia Tech, she's now at uh, uh, UBC, University of British Columbia, developed uh, this idea called soil profile rebuilding, um, which was based on English double spading. Um, so we uh, essentially, uh, in, in her uh, uh, experiment, um, if, if you had topsoil, uh, good, good quality topsoil, you might remove it. And if the, the soil underneath you want to, was compacted um, in some way, um, you might remove the topsoil. Spread a, a small amount of compost, uh, uh, four or five inches, um, and then just take a backhoe and dig through it and drop it. Dig and drop. Um, and you only really need the compost if the subsoil is lower than 2% uh, organic matter. Then um, I like to throw uh, a little more compost on the surface um, and rototill through that to break up these big clumps of, of soil. Um, and if I have topsoil, I would, would bring that topsoil back at that point. The only real limitation is that uh, we can't do this when we're, we're too wet. Um, and so we uh, uh, need to worry a little bit about our weather conditions. These were the, the results of Susan Day's profile rebuilding um, at Virginia Tech. Uh, this was a six year study uh, looking at growing different kinds of trees and these methods. And the green line is her soil profile rebuilding and the red line is undisturbed topsoil, the best topsoil um, in the, the valley of which Virginia Tech sits. It's beautiful topsoil and she beat tree um, uh, the, the tree performance in her, her uh, soil, soil profile rebuilding beat really good topsoil in, in, in all but one of the, uh, the tree species uh, that she looked at. It's a pretty, pretty convincing study. Uh, Tom Smiley and I started looking at uh, 
sand-based structural soils and loam soils in Boston. Uh, this is a study of 33 trees. Uh, the orange are sand-based structural soils. Uh, the blue are loam soils uh, unscreened in suspended pavement systems. And then uh, the green are loam soils uh, in open planters. Um, and you can see that uh, we that, that the loam soil clearly is the, the, the big winner in this particular um, application. Uh, Tom Smiley down at the Bartlett Lab did a study where he looked at loam soils and silva cells and strata cells, um, and then looked at compared to sand-based structural soils um, and gravel uh, bed uh, based structural soils, which is essentially CU soil. Um, and here is our, our um, initial plant growth. Uh, this study went on for three years um, and was published in, uh, in Journal of Arboriculture. Um, and uh, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty convincing uh, look at you know, highly controlled study uh, with, with all the boxes checked for, for good science. So could we use this idea for even stormwater treatment soil where we're putting in almost pure sand? Um, you know, what, what kind of performance can we get from that? Uh, North Carolina State University did this project, which was, I think, was a five-year study uh, where they, they, uh, they had uh, compacted controls, uh, uncompacted controls, um, and then they did deep tilling, similar to the prof uh, Susan's uh, profile rebuilding, and then shallow tilling where you just rototilled the soil. Um, and you can see in the, 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 the graph, uh, the compacted uh, soils, uh, the percent runoff um, uh, gets to be pretty high in, in the compacted. And for the shallow till, we get to around 10% runoff. And the deep till, it's barely measurable, uh, the runoff uh, uh, for, uh, through these soils. Um, so that, and also, the, the nutrient um, uh, uh, um, capture um, of these soils uh, exceeded the state standards uh, that were being used for other um, soils. Okay, uh, just wanted to show you Gary and Tom's, um, which I had the pleasure of visiting and was able to steal a, a shovel full of soil from the, there uh, with the gardener. Um, uh, and you can see this is a sandy loam, um, but it's got a fair amount of clay and silt in it. It's basically Thames River Valley soil. Uh, nothing was ever done to it. Um, it's only two feet thick and supporting some really large trees. Um, and I, I asked the, the gardener what kind of problems were they having? And she said, well, uh, we don't have a very large budget. He said, and my big problem is I've never been able to fertilize this soil. I can't get the budget to do it. I go, well, why would you want to fertilize this soil? The plants are fabulous. Um, so it's performing quite well uh, on a very low budget, uh, 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 maintenance budget. Um, and we're, I think, 10 stories in the air in the middle of downtown London. Um, and we kept doing this idea for a long time. Most of the, the major roof garden projects, uh, this is Skyline Park in, in Chicago, built in 1968. It's just the native prairie black soil. Um, and here it is today, uh, functioning beautifully um, uh, as a, a very intensively used landscape um, uh, uh, related to this um, apartment complex right on the, the lake shore of Chicago. So I'm going to end with this idea. Um, we all, I think, know the critical aspects of soil. Uh, uh, and uh, so I've got them arranged here in, in the diagram with the profile on the side, um, which is an important aspect of soil. Um, the problem is that in our specifications, um, this is that diagram as it shows up in our specification where we put a huge amount of importance on texture and nutrients, organic matter, 
um, and far less importance on uh, density, uh, structure, uh, pH profile. And I wrote time in here. Uh, you can barely see it. Uh, we don't consider time to be important. Um, and so the, um, the ur our urban soil science um, and recommendations for soil from our soil consultants are not by any means settled science. We need a lot of research uh, to move on. I would like to propose that um, get it here. But this is the way our specifications should look. Uh, that we should have a very uh, um, strong look at profile, density, and structure. Um, that time should be considered within our specifications. Um, on the chemical side, pH is really the important factor. Nutrients almost have no, there's, there's very little nutrient problems with our soil. Um, and even sand, uh, the, the texture of sand, silt, and clay can have a huge window, and we shouldn't be putting so much importance um, on that. So I think longer specifications are not necessarily better. We need to, simple, to develop simpler ways of defining our product goals and fo focus on what is actually important and makes a difference um, in the outcome. So that's the end of my talk. Um, I went a little over, we started a little late uh, and I will pass it on. I don't know if is Tatiana uh, been able to sign on or are we moving to Paul? Tatiana, are you, are you able to go? Yes, I am here. Awesome. I am so, I've had some windy situations here in Canada for some reason today. <laughs> The winds came through and I lost power a couple of times, but I think it's simmered down now. So we're a okay. Okay, great. And we're going to turn over to Tatiana Morin of the New York City Urban Soils Institute. Thank you. If you, can, you can hear me okay. It's not interrupted. You sound great. Oh, Woo. okay, great. Okie dokie. Okay, um, I wanted to thank everybody for having me here. Um, it's been ex really exciting and encouraging to hear everybody's talks. Um, I've been just nodding in the background all the time. So uh, I'm, I'm learning a lot. Uh, I hope that this can contribute to the conversation. Um, uh, what I find extremely difficult uh, to do with soil is give elevator pitches. So um, Jordan, please feel free to cut me off because if I get really into it, I'm just going to keep going on and on. So uh, please don't be shy about telling you my time is up. <laughs> um, soils are extremely I'll complex. I'll reach out to you in the chat. Pardon? I'll reach out to you in the chat for time. Okay, great. Um, if I don't, If I don't hear you though, feel free to just you know, <clears throat> clear your throat or something. <laughs> okay. Um, so the beautiful thing about soils is that they are uh, extremely nuanced. Um, and many times in scientific research or literature um, or scientific outreach to the public, um, soils are many times referred to as soil. Um, and I have a problem with that. Uh, soils are extremely diverse and uh, that was extremely apparent in the previous presentation given by Jim Urban. Um, they are, depending on where they came from, uh, what geography they've belonged to, how they've developed, um, what their influences have been, uh, soils are diver as, as diverse as people and their functions and their health are as diverse as our own. So um, when I think about soils, um, I like to relate it to the human, because there are so many synergies there. There's so many metaphors there. How soils behave and how they adapt is very similar to how our own guts adapt to our environment. So without further ado, um, let's get into what are urban soils. Um, again, so urban soils are soils that are found in our city. So 
the urban part is actually a label that we tend to give soils. Um, it's a label for soils that fit into a geographic area that is defined by a human boundary, not a natural boundary. So in fact, um, urban soils are literally the soils in our city, but they are much more than what we consider, as Jim said earlier, there is a kind of a stigma that when you think of urban soils, you think of um, contaminated or just, you know, um, destroyed or somewhat negatively affected soils. And that is not necessarily the case. Um, and it seems I might be preaching to the choir here since um, landscape architects probably know that better than anybody. So again, what are urban soils? They are everything that's encompassed in the city boundary. So that would include our natural soils um, soils that we would consider uh, native, native meaning um, in a place like New York City, where very little of our land hasn't been given to real estate at some point in its lifetime. Um, we think about places like uh, the NYBG Hemlock Forest, or we'll think of uh, Inwood Hill Park, places where these soils have been relatively undisturbed for at least 150 years or more. And so we can kind of see their natural soil development there. Um, the soils that have developed in situ uh, according to their parent material and have developed with their um, local climate and geography uh, influencing them. Whereas uh, anthropogenic soils, which is what people generally kind of umbrella um, under the urban soil label, um, are soils that have been altered or disturbed by our human activities. Um, so that changes kind of their development process. They develop the same as natural soils, but they kind of get interrupted several times. And so that can alter their chemistry. It can um, move them away from their original parent material. It can maybe um, eliminate their horizonations. So you have a lot of changes there. Um, but this uh, human involvement in, the, in these, um, in these soils is not necessarily a negative thing. There are many positives there, so we'll get into that. So what I like to do is try to clarify uh, what we mean when we talk about urban soils. Um, because urban soils include both the natural and native soils plus the disturbed soils, um, usually when we talk about urban soils, we can uh, refine that and um, specify that what we really mean is we're talking about the human altered or the anthropogenic soils. So these um, have been classified by the USDA, um, well, at least in this part of the world and by the um, WRB and other parts of the world like in Europe um, to determine what classifies a soil as being um, human altered. So that's usually uh, has a certain percentage of artifacts, 10% um, or more. And then it, it, from the surface down, how visible is this human disturbance before you hit kind of like the native soil horizons and development of that parent soil. So many times when we think of human altered soil, we think of addition of artifacts. There's loss of horizonation, meaning you don't have those really distinct layers, the A, the AO, the E, the B, the C horizons. Um, many times you lose the topsoil because that's the easiest thing to scrape off. Uh, you get leveling, uh, cutting and filling depending on your application. So if you're building something or you're making a park and you want things to look different, you just scrape off the top, bring in something new, that kind of thing. Addition of fill. So us uh, living in New York City, we're a coastal city. So a lot of dredging happening along the coastlines where we have to constantly move stuff. Um, one of our co-founders of the USI, Paul Mankiewicz, I always quote him saying, we are the bigger, biggest movers of stuff. So our species loves to move stuff and soils is one of those things. So um, when we look at New York City soils, it's basically a mishmash of things having been moved from one place to another. Um, soils are constantly being tossed around, um, either adding more land for real estate or disposing of waste or um, just doing some rearranging. And of course, we are all very familiar with sealed surfaces. Those are our uh, pavements. As we all know, our schools, a lot of our school playgrounds in New York City were paved over once upon a time. That was a big fad. Our backyards are paved over, sidewalks, streets. And believe it or not, below that, we do have soils. And believe it or not, yes, they are alive. And yes, they're doing something. 
a little bit different from the exposed soils, but nonetheless, sealed soils are a huge new hot topic in the research world. Um, but what's also interesting to consider, which doesn't um, get enough talk kind of in the amount of street talk about engineered soils, which could also be called constructed soils, which are also known as technosols in the research world, engineered soils. So these are soils that were either um, by default affected because we were, you know, doing some rearrangement in our city, but many of them are intentionally created. So they are maybe waste products that uh, create a new soil um, using recipe of a native soil. So they're there, it's kind of like a biomimicry of a native soil. So it's an imitation of a natural soil to, to um, harness the parameters that you're looking for to support a certain application, like a stormwater capture system, for example, or a green roof. So we imitate a natural soil, but we um, improve some of those parameters to either make it lightweight or um, to be able to hold water really well or um, you know, increase its nutrient capacity. Um, and then we've got rehabilitated soil. So let's say we have a um, you know, degraded urban forest and um, we want to uh, make the ecosystem a little bit healthier. So we'll rehab those soils and amend them in a way that they can imitate their natural counterparts a lot better and provide better ecosystem services. So as you can see, urban soils um, becomes extremely nuanced and a lot more complicated than your agricultural or natural soil. So soils in an urban area vary um, in their um, degradation or their improvement depending on the land use. So obviously the least disturbed soils in the city are the kind of the natural areas. Um, think places like cemeteries where you haven't had much disturbance or movement except for um, burial sites. But in the other parts, there are many areas of the cemeteries that are basically undisturbed for 200 years or more. And then you get to recreation parkland, residential areas, and then you get into the urban core. So there's a whole scale of urban, urban soils. Um, so when you think about urban soils and, their dis and the effects of their disturbance, um, you think mainly of uh, destroying soil structure. Um, and that comes across as a negative impact, um, but it's the easiest one to affect. Uh, when soil is forming, just kind of like in your compost, there's a certain amount of development that happens and a soil structure that stabilizes the soil and um, keeps it at some kind of equilibrium so that it can keep growing and improving. It's kind of like developing the skeleton of your body. Your bones are there to hold all your flesh and your skin in place. Soil structure does the same thing. So as soon as you ride over it or dig into it or alter it some way, you've affected the soil structure. Uh, you change chemical properties. Um, in many cases, you have addition of, um, you know, chemicals or uh, artifacts that were not naturally there. So now you've affected the chemical properties. Again, not necessarily a negative thing, it's just a change. You alter the biological productivity, uh, you affect the microbiology, the microbiome, um, you affect the root zone. Um, and again, you add new materials. So this is a kind of all an alteration that the, the soil systems now have to kind of adapt to. Now to go back to understand how the soils can develop it, you think about soil development. Now there are five soil forming factors that persist whether you are in a natural setting or in an anthropogenic setting. These five soil forming factors, there's never one missing. They're always in action. Um, and this was discovered by the father of soil science, um, Vasily Dakuchayev in the 1800s and persisted ever since. So your five soil forming factors are time. And I know that in uh, Jim's uh, presentation, that's one that is easy to ignore or forget about, but it's an extremely important factor. Climate, your topography, uh, your parent material, uh, here it says vegetation and animals, but we could kind of put that under the umbrella of biota, which is where the human walk come in when it comes to urban soil forming factors. As you can see, the little diagram on the right um, offers the same 
five soil forming factors, except where it, where it used to say vegetation animals replace it with the human factor. So that is the part of the development of soils that is um, this factor is the largest and the strongest in an urban setting. So what makes um, these anthropogenic soils really different from their native counterparts is that you get a lot of heterogeneity in New York City. So for example, we worked on a vacant lot once in, the, um, in Harlem and in that lot that was like 30 by 20, um, we had about, I don't know, about seven different pockets of different parent materials and different chemistry happening. So in this one pocket, we had sand. In this one pocket, we had clay. In this other pocket, we had slag. Um, in the other part, we had concrete and debris. The other part, we had fill. So you get really intense heterogeneity in New York City. So you can never um, kind of do a general sweep of an area. When you're doing a site assessment, you have to be very specific not only about the um, lateral spatial differences, but even when you start to think considering depth, your first two inches might tell you a completely different story than the next two feet or the next two meters. So there's a lot of variability there. You get additions of artifacts, so it's not uncommon to dig up a brick or a piece of glass or something that did not come from the natural setting. Again, you have altered chemistry um, and you get um, what we found has been very widespread is the change in pH. So in, when you add a lot of these human artifacts to the soils, a lot of them are carbon-based, uh, um, sorry, um, calcium-based. So you end up with a much higher pH in an altered human soil than you do in its native soil, which has a kind of like a more of an acidic profile of around somewhere between 4.7 and 6, somewhere covering between 5, 5.5. And uh, all of our urban or human altered soils in New York City hover around eight. So that's a really big difference, especially when you're trying to consider bringing in back native landscapes. Um, you have altered soil temperatures, again, for the same reasons, when you alter the chemistry, alter the microbes, so you have different temperature regimes. Um, organic matter, you know, sometimes you can be hard pressed to find any when you're in an urban core area. And then the high potential for compaction, um, loss of biology or structures, just because when you have actual physical reconstruction of these soils, that's what you disturb first is a soil structure. So if you're not careful to preserve it or, or restore it, then you're going to easily lead to compaction. Uh, generally higher levels of contaminants, uh, very true. We have a problem of legacy contamination in New York City. Um, it's been kind of like, uh, just like a cycle of certain contaminants just will never actually go away. So they just get airborne and redeposited and the cycle keeps them going through. So that's in, um, when we consider contaminants, we think about heavy metals and organics. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a bit. So where is our hope in uh, working with these soils? Well, uh, a big one is in its texture. Um, so sand, silt, and clay are the mineral components of the soil and those are very hard to change. Um, they're very hard to alter unless you're actually bringing in a pile of sand on top or a pile of clay on top, but it's hard to kind of alter the natural recipe of the soil texture that's in place at that time. The bonus to that is, however, that you have a great foundation to work with, good building blocks to work with. If you can understand the soil texture, understand what its capacity is, then you can apply amendments to create a soil that can function at its optimal capacity with that soil texture. So that becomes an extremely important ingredient in um, deciding how to best use the soils that you have in place, unless you're planning to cap and bring soils on top. Um, again, if, if you may all be familiar with this, maybe not, but um, there's a soil triangle and this is a way to help you, there's different ways to do this. You can do this by uh, a lab, a lab um, method with using a hydrometer or a jar test, or you can do this by feel. Uh, and you can define your soil texture is, and that will allow you to infer certain things like cation exchange capacity, um, nutrient hold capacity, water hold capacity, infiltration capacities. So it is the beginning story of your soil's skeleton um, from which you can start to build. Um, so a, a potential tool for landscape architects, and um, maybe there are a few of you out there that know about this um, and find it useful. Maybe a few of you don't know about it, um, but 
the USDA launched what they called the urban soil surveys. It was um, very popular to have rural uh, or agricultural um, soil surveys done, but these uh, New York City was the first urban soil survey. Um, so what they did, these scientists went out there and they dug soil pits about a meter deep where, where they could dig a meter deep and then they characterized the soils and all the horizons to give useful information for people who could use the soil survey to then determine best land use managements or best land use applications for the soils in their area. So um, we have the reconnaissance soil survey, the citywide initial soil survey, and now they're launching what they're calling the dynamic soil survey, which will uh, add a lot more interesting components um, like carbon storage and vegetation um, and other important aspects to the soil survey besides just the physical and chemical parameters. Um, so what this soil survey has showed us is that we have um, impervious urban land so that makes up 62% of our entire city. We've got fill soils. So those are soils that have been uh, brought from other places, um, for example, dredge material or a construction site that got rid of their fill and needed to put it somewhere else. So we've got fill soils that make up 27% of our soils in the city. Our natural soils, we what we have left of our native soils, there's 8% of our area is made up of those. And then we've got other miscellaneous areas. So it's just give you kind of like a wide view picture of what we've got. Um, so there uh, is a lot of research that has gone into um, understanding the impact of artifacts in the soils. Um, each artifact that is added to the soil carries its own um, chemical signature. So as that's added to the soil, um, scientists are trying to understand how influential these um, artifacts are to their soil and its development over time. Um, and if it poses any concerns or risks or if it just affects um, the geochemical kind of development. Um, so this is a, a very intense study and um, many have focused their attention on this. And, you know, when you think about slag being available or you get, you're planting hypersensitive plants, this becomes very critical. So um, this is just an array of pictures that show you kind of what the soil profiles look like in a naturally deposited material. So these are our natural soils in New York City. Um, so when you access the soil survey, these are the kind of profiles you get to see and it gives you kind of a window into what is the basement or the support system of the ecosystem that's living on top. Um, here are our, our soils formed in human deposited altered materials. So you can see there's a big difference. So, you know, visual observation is a huge part of understanding soils. Um, you can see a lot of differences here already. There's just these massive, um, amounts of disturbances um, kind of truncated and dictated by different textures and different colors. So the web soil survey is accessible to everybody. Um, it's on the USDA website and you basically define an area of interest on the map and you zone in further and further and further. You can either do that by drawing a pentagon or you can um, type in an address and it'll bring, me to, bring you to that site. And then you can download um, a report that gives you the chemical and physical parameters of the soils in that area. Um, one thing to be very uh, aware of is that they are, um, uh, it's very determined on, um, uh, you know, the size of the soil survey. So some soil surveys, they will, a soil pit and then they will define that soil for an acre. So if you're looking at a very specific small spot in an urban backyard, you'll have to consider that maybe that scale wide, uh, you take it with a grain of salt, it might not be very accurate for your very accurate site. Um, the nice thing here is that you can actually access this on your phone as well. So you could be walking in New York City and access the soil survey right on your phone. This is just a picture depicting on, uh, this is in Greenwood Cemetery. Um, so this is a, an active soil pit where we were in there actually characterizing the soil. So it's a very involved process, um, uh, very engaging and a great learning opportunity for everybody. And we try and make this accessible to the public um, so you can join along and see what it takes to characterize the soil. So when you go onto the soil survey, you can access things like your soil chemical properties, your soil physical properties, the erosion factor, 
So qualities and specific features to that area, for example, if it's very, um, you know, very good farmland or if it's wetland um, or if it has a tendency to have a high water table. Um, so water features, your saturation rates, your infiltration rates. So it can be a very good kind of home base starter point for looking at your soils. Um, you can apply all this information when you're looking at doing restoration or revegetation re or remediation or climate resiliency, um, stormwater management. So if you're looking to site a, you know, a bioswale, um, it's important to look at your, your sublayers of your soils, understand what its hydrologic components are, so whether or not your uh, biosoil is actually going to work or if it's going to pond. Um, for urban agriculture, understanding your best areas to um, create the best yields. And then um, for deciding what places are best left for conservation management. So soil contamination, can't leave this uh, talk without mentioning something about this because usually when we give workshops all over the city, this is the only thing people care to know about. Uh, this is how urban soils get their bad rap. Um, no, not all urban soils are contaminated, but yes, contamination is a huge issue. One thing I think should be made very clear is that soils aren't contaminated, they get contaminated. So there's your difference right there. Soils are always acting as a buffer to your health with their development factors and their um, physical structure. They are always just like your own body is always trying to restore itself to an equilibrium. So no matter how many times you punch it in the face, it wants to get better. It wants to serve its function, its capacities, its ecosystem benefits. Um, maybe not in the timeline that is useful to us, but they are constantly restoring themselves unless they've been completely pummeled and you end up with dehydrated soils like you get in the Dust Bowl in the 1930s. Um, but what I'm trying to say here is that yes, a soil can get contaminated, but there is always a restoration capacity. It's never just cap and get rid of it or let's pay millions of dollars and remove it. That's, that's old news. That's the old way of doing things. Soils have a much better capacity to actually live through their abuse and, and become better. We might have to create a biological cap so that they can keep restoring their needs so that, and we can bring in constructed or engineered soils on top so that we can fulfill the application needs in a, in a, in a quicker manner. But there's always, um, if you understand how soils function and live and behave and develop, then there's a way to harness their power to optimize their ecosystem services, which is basically their capacity to um, have ecosystem function. So yes, cities are sinks for heavy metals. Um, that's a big one in New York City. And in many cases, they just get recycled. So once you've cleaned a site, there's always you know, potential risk of atmospheric deposition. So you'd always have to consider that. Um, maybe creating green walls to kind of dissipate the atmospheric deposition. There's many ways of looking at that. Um, again, there is this is still a new frontier of research. We don't know about all of our contaminants in the city. We still have to figure out what our baseline is and our distribution of that. But just a reminder, um, you know, landscape architecture is what shapes a community. It, what, it's what uses nature's recipe to restore and improve our cities. Um, and to harness a soil's capacities to do that is basically the key because soils do ecology. So um, if we understand that, uh, we, can, we can work through anything. So uh, I think my take home message here too is that we've got a lot of potential to create remediation strategies. Um, there's something called the Clean Soils Bank, which actually mines native soils that are sediments from below the fill cap in New York City. And these are clean sediments to basically your skeleton, your sand, silt, and clay that you can work with and amend to improve places that are contaminated or that have been disturbed or altered in such a way that it's hard to harness their capacities in a timely manner. Um, but most important is to start with um, soil testing, um, which you can do by reaching out to the Urban Soils Institute and get some basic parameters done so you understand what you're working with. I hope I covered mostly everything. Uh, hopefully we'll can cover more in question and answer um, and it'd be great to meet you all. Thanks for your time.
Thanks so much, Tatiana. That was great. Yeah, sorry we have to have such a condensed format, but I definitely hope to hear more from you in the Q&A session. Uh, next up, we have Paul Josie, a landscape architect of Wolf, Wolf Josie Landscape Architects, here to share with us. Paul? Great. All right. Uh, thanks very much, Jordan. Let me just share here. Second. Got to change one thing here. Uh, well, I guess this will be. Well, It'll be the slides will be hidden on the side as well. I'm going to go to full screen, but I'm uh, let's see here. Well, all right, we get to see my speaker notes and such as we go along. Um, I apologize for this. How we uh, one second? I know I can figure this out anyway. All right, well. Good morning or afternoon. Sorry, there we go. Um, late afternoon. Here we are. And um, how not to break your soils. Uh, we're going to talk about just generally what we have to. Um, I'm sure I can get this to. All right. Well, anyway, how not to break your soil. So soils in general, we know, you know, there's plenty of great um, examples of, of healthy trees and soils throughout New York. Um, these places are um, really um, retreats and, and these sort of special spots. I mean, when you think about trees and you think about the, um, well, if you're if you're into to birds and insects and habitat, they have so much value there. If you just, um, I think one of those critical ones is just a place to get outside. Obviously, this past year, getting outside has really been vital, and uh, being able to see others outside has been completely vital. And that's that's true whether it's a pandemic or not. And the importance of being outside and and being outside should be uh, enjoyable. It should be hospitable. There should be a you know you should hear the sounds of birds, and you should have lowered blood pressure. And you you know there's all these other intrinsic values of of soils, but of so of trees, um, and that is really a result of of, um, of soils, which we'll get to, but you probably have seen this study. This was something the Washington Post looked at, um, the, the heat island effect of certain neighborhoods in uh, Washington, DC. And these were really, uh, you can see associated with Rock Creek Park, lots of trees, you know, these sort of neighborhoods with a lot of tree canopy um, had these really cooler afternoons. You can imagine almost 85 degrees in one side of the city. And then, um, you know, you know you're, less than a half mile away and you have, you know, a 17 degree difference in your heat. So it makes for, you know, actually healthy soils and healthy trees make for sort of these equitable spaces, these high, hot places, you know, there's high stress levels, high health risks, not to mention the utility bills and the carbon dioxide emissions. Um, you know, in the summertime, a tree, a healthy tree on the south side of a building can reduce your building's um, energy uses by 50%. That's 50% of uh, you know, a carbon dioxide emission reduction just by having a healthy tree on one side of your, your building. I did a similar study in New York um, looking at, um, you know, if you are spending your afternoon in the ravine or something and, uh, you know, you may be experiencing, you know, an, uh, an 80 degree day and then you have a day 105 degrees almost anywhere else in the city, uh, block to block and a 25 degree difference where there's vegetation and where there's where there's not, where there's density of vegetation. So trees have you know small ability to to cool spaces, but also you know much larger scale uh, significant benefits. And why does why does this uh, matter? Well, we know climate has is changing. It has been changing. It will change. In six years, there's a warmer future. There's stranger weather patterns. Uh, we will you know in six years, New York is projected to feel if, if we if we reduce our emissions if, if we we do everything we can to reduce them it'll feel more like um, weather in baltimore so it'll actually have uh, about oh, four degrees warmer in the winter time uh, also have about 10 degrees uh, drier in the winter 
So, you know, less, less snow, um, you know, that it'll be sort of rainier winters if there is rain, well, not rainier, but rain instead of snow in the winters. And, and that's not to say that there's also going to be shifting weather patterns as well. But if you think about if we don't change our, our emissions, New York will change into be more um, like Northwest Arkansas will be a, a closer model. And this is, um, this is the University of Maryland uh, worked on this through the FITS lab, shiny apps. You can check this out, um, put this together. But what is concerning is that 10 degrees wetter and then you have eight degrees warmer and trees are going to be sort of the answer to some of these, um, these, these concerns that we have in the future. Uh, so, you know, what's our option? You know, is that, you know, is this really the condition that we're going to look at if we don't get our souls right? And, and maybe you say, oh, that's not fair. Like this is a park, this is a streetscape, um, you know, but what if, you know, what if we really design perfect sites? You know, so here's, you know, one of our perfect sites, you know, year one, the trees go in. If you haven't been paying attention to the soils, um, you know, maybe year two, um, you know, maybe, maybe you got some bad plant stock. Maybe, maybe you didn't get your irrigation just right. Uh, maybe you um, didn't get your soils um, just right. Um, you, you lose a tree. Year three, um, you know, in place, in, in, someone has forgotten, is year five, sorry. People have sort of forgotten about what that tree was supposed to be and they didn't replace it. Maybe it was tough to get it at, into it. You know, the, the contractor shows up and it's like, well, how do I even get that grade up? I need two people. Is that, does that come up? Um, you know, so, and then you come back in year 10 and, you know, this is your prize winning design, you know, that that's, and this is no one's intent. Like no one wants this to happen. You spend a lot of time planning for your trees and such, but this is often what can happen. And this may be the next 60 years, you know, 60 years of this site. So, you know, there are questions about sort of, wow, you know, can tree, you know, how do trees grow? You know, now we have lots of soil mixes and such, but trees can grow in all sorts of conditions. You know, do we, are these soils broken? You know, this tree is doing pretty well right on the side of the road. You know, are, are these, are these soils all broken? You know, they're still managing to grow pretty big, um, you know, generally healthy trees. Um, you know, even in Central Park, I mean, the, uh, so many of these soils are imported, um, you know, as they try to get the grades right. Uh, th this is, you know, did this work, you know? <laughs> and then, you know, do some soils grow better trees than other soils? Um, you know, an instance here, these are the same trees, the same, same nursery they were, came from. One is growing in um, a sort of a, a loam-based planting soil. One's growing in a sand-based structural soil. They're both, they're both, they're both living. Um, but they're both surviving. But is that enough? Like, should your trees, you know, in 60 years when we have sort of a different, you know, longer droughts or, or, or warmer temperatures, do you want trees that just sort of survive or trees that thrive? Um, so uh, this, is, this is a little bit tricky to go third after the both of the incredible speakers today because <laughs> um, a lot of information has been covered. A lot of points have been discussed. We should have all talked about exactly what we were gonna talk about, but we will talk about texture, holding capacity and structure. There's lots of other elements, soil biology, pH, nutrients, action drainage, critical pieces, um, but we're gonna focus on texture, structure and holding capacity and making great soils. Um, so first structure. You know this because you just saw this, but obviously there's different particle size sizes for each type, you know, sand, silt, clay. Sand has, you know, very big particle sizes, but as you get into smaller uh, particles like silt and clay, they're very small particle sizes. And then, then you also have this texture triangle that um, Tatiana just showed a minute ago or 10 minutes ago. Um, and this shows your ratio of sand, silt, and clay in your mix. So when we say you have a loamy sand, you know that you have a lot of sand in that mix. You have a, a small percentage of, of actual silt and clay in that mix. If we say it's a loam, it, it has actually a, a larger you know, mix of silt and um, silt sand, kind of an even mixture of silt sand with some clay in there. Um, you know, so just know how these are, are read and under, how these are understood. But soil texture, 
is another way to sort of look at it from a more um, maybe cosmic look. This, you know, sand particles are large. Um, they have lots of pore space going through, you know, the ability of pore space. And then clay particles are very small. Silt particles are kind of in that small, a little bit bigger. Um, so, and this is, there's this kind of these ranges in between. Um, your, this, this texture uh, has a direct relationship with your nutrient holding capacity of your soil. So imagine each one of these soil particles has, um, has a limited number of nutrients or cations that's able to attach to it. Um, so this is, uh, you know, if you think about a sand soil, when you're at the beach, water kind of runs right through that. The, the, the nutrients, the, are, uh, the actual hydrogen, and actually uh, uh, hydrogen is not attaching to that sand, it's kind of moving right through it. But if you um, pour water into a more of a, a sandy clay loam soil, um, that water will kind of be absorbed like a sponge into that soil because there's a lot more smaller particles. Each particle is sort of able to absorb that water. Um, so small particle sizes um, are able to absorb more nutrients, essentially. So we call this the cation exchange. And um, when you're reading soil tests, you may see a cation exchange that, that you know, a, a rate of about 10 or above is adequate um, when you're looking at this. Um, a, a rate of 20 is great, you know, or, or good, you know. And typical soils, if you have a loamy sand mix, um, this is a, you know, a five to 10, which is low in the cation exchange. So often, if you're making a sand mix, you kind of fill it with compost um, so that you are sort of upping the cation exchange, the holding capacity, sort of acting like a sponge in your mix. So you add a lot of compost to that, uh, to, to do that. So loams have um, sort of a higher amount. And then, you know, as you get more clay, the clay again, the smaller particles is able to absorb more nutrients. And why is that important? Because remember, being able to hold nutrients in your soil makes for a more uh, durable soil because you're less reliant on irrigation um, during droughts, um, during dry weather. Um, that soil is able to retain that moisture for use by the plants in at later dates. So if you have a soil that drains completely and it gets very dry um, with that low CEC, um, your plants can dry out quick as well. Um, so, um, and then and then the, the third key sort of soil element is soil structure. And so we're Soil structure and I love, um, you know, even Bill Watterson had a good understanding of soil structure, these kind of clumps and peds of soil in his illustrations and the biology in there. And, um, anyway, soils with a good soil structure, again, as, as Jim both mentioned and Tatiana mentioned, uh, sort of that, that um, those, those big um, peds or chunks of soil, that is kind of naturally creating these fissures um, in, the, in the soil that the biology can live in. If you are screening your soil, what is happening is you're sifting out that structure, you're getting rid of it, and you're kind of separating out some rocks and debris, and, and you're just kind of making this flower, if you will. You've lost your structure. Another way to think about it is, um, you know, a bowl of granola. Um, a bowl of granola has a lot of pore space. It's these sort of aggregates that are being held together. And uh, and this is, you know, you can see, you know, when you pour, uh, you know, oat milk or whatever you're putting in there, um, that it's, uh, that it'll sort of move through there, but it will also absorb into those, those clusters or those peds. Uh, it's a late day, so sorry for too much food discussion, but um, screen soils, when they get wet. Um, they actually bind, um, they, they can actually lock up. All those fine, you know, separated particles can bind if they're sort of more of a, of a silt a base or a, a clay base. So you don't want to ever damage your very small particles like your silt and your clays. Um, sand is a little more resilient. We'll get to that in a second. So the role of soil texture on structure. So kind of, this is kind of blending things together here. Clay soils, um, have these um, actually somewhat platy structure in the actual particles themselves. Um, so they actually will resist deep compaction. Those plates will sort of lay on top of one another. And so you're, you're, you actually have a very strong soil structure in clay soils. And that compaction, whether it's from a vehicle or a person, and you imagine you know, a person's foot you know, has potentially, you know, 300 to 400 pounds per square foot. I mean, a foot has a significant amount of loading. Anyway, 
to just, but, but think about um, the clay soils are, because the small particles are able to distribute the load sooner. Um, so you say there's a really strong structure. It doesn't, you know, compaction doesn't go deep into those soils. As you move towards um, silt, silt can have a bit of a weaker structure. Um, it doesn't have those kind of small, the particles is a little larger and they're not as, um, they're a little bit bigger and they, um, they can compact deeper into the profile and it doesn't form as good of a structure generally. Um, and, you know, as you have more clay into those silt, so it actually makes a pretty strong structure. So increased clay, more um, compaction resistance over time. And then when you get to sand, um, you know, the sort of the thing about sand is there's really no structure in sand. Um, a a sand-based soil, if you will, is relying on the voids between the sand particles to sort of, um, so you can compact the heck out of it. The structure is happening in those, uh, in those, those pores between the, the large particle sizes, essentially. So this, uh, you know, sort of why certain soil types, you know, uh, these, these loam soil types with this kind of mix this kind of, you know, more clay it actually builds a much more durable structure over time. Again, looking at sort of, you've seen these graphs before, I'm not going to repeat too much, but, you know, generally your sort of natural soil will have these void spaces in them. This diagram is sort of one way to look at this diagram. This is the same diagram essentially showing where your soil particles are and where your water and, and, and void space would occur in that. And you know, when you pick up some um, uh, sort of a, a pet of soil and sort of break it along those lines, you'll see actually, you'll see those void spaces in there. You'll, you'll understand sort of where the biology and the roots can grow into those spaces. Um, so this is uh, sort of the, the critical relationship what's happening in that soil to make that structure. And, and finally, you know, this is a, a farming example, an agricultural example, but it's actually very um, applicable to um, screened soils or heavily damaged soils. Um, once you've sort of damaged soils, you can actually, um, you know, the actual settle out, you know, you actually get a lot of erosion in soil type, in certain soil types um, that you won't if you have untilled soil. So there's a, a correlation there, but. Um, and then we're gonna look in this last bit about soil performance, looking at three different sites. Uh, these are sites are all within, you know, very close to one another. And we're looking at them at different times of their, um, their development at five years, 30 years, and 60 years. And we're going to look at two um, uh, loamy sand mixes, um, one that was um, installed about five years ago, one that was installed 30 years ago. And then we're going to look at, uh, by contrast, um, a, a loam soil that's kind of an imported um, soil that was brought to these sites. So all of these soils are imported in each of these sites. And what we, um, you, you know, notice right away in the soil results, um, the, the recent soil at five years, this mix um, had a very high organic matter percentage. Um, this is, you know, sort of standard soils about 2.5 to 5%. Um, you know, and this is, you know, telling me that there's a lot of compost that's been added to these soils. And we looked at them, they were actually really dark, really almost black um, soils. Um, it had a very high cation exchange capacity, which was a good thing. There's really a, a, a correlation probably to the to the high compost levels, um, and the pH was 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 fine. It was low, which factored well. I'm not going to get into other. Um, the other site, which is interesting, the 30 year old um, loamy sand mix. We knew when this was installed, there was actually a lot of compost in this um, mix, but this one had a 1.6 organic matter level. This was very low. Um, and, and this had a very low cation exchange capacity as well. Um, this was the lowest of any of the areas we tested. But, and then finally looking at a loam, this was installed in 1930. Um, this was, um, sorry, that, um, yeah, anyway, that's, anyway, 1930. Uh, this was a 4.5% organic matter, pretty healthy organic matter for a, a, you know, a lawn soil that, that was installed, um, you know, actually quite a, quite a while ago. Um, 90 years ago. So um, the cation exchange capacity was, you know, fine. It's, you know, it's, it's in that adequate range. Um, when we looked at the trees, um, the soil, the, the, the sites from 2016, um, the magnolia, the American elm, the, the beech, the ginkgo, the katsura trees were all exhibiting stress. Um, certain species in this area were actually um, really healthy that were sort of used to these sort of like well-drained sites. So some um, trees that were planted in this area did look good, but a lot of trees actually had a lot of signs of stress. In the next site, the other loamy sand, 
uh, mix. This, the trees that we saw thought initially, well, they look pretty good, uh, but found out that they actually had been replaced um, uh, between uh, 2011, 2016. So the trees um, you know, made it about 20, 25 years, and then they, um, they, they died. And honey locust, you know, they're not long lived trees, but 40 to 50 years could be an average, you know, given it's grown in, in decent soil and such. And there's a lot of examples of honey locusts. A lot of them were planted in the 80s and 90s uh, and, and 70s. And <laughs> um, that they, um, there's a lot of examples that we can show that they've been planted and they're still thriving today. Um, so them dying at 25 years was um, concerning and sort of telling of something else happening. And then looking at the loam soil, um, you know, the trees, uh, a mix of American elm and Dawn Redwood were all in very good health or, or generally good health. Some slightly stunted growth, um, but, but nothing of concern. The trees were all showing um, good, good health. We looked at irrigation usage on the sites. Um, this recent site was using the most irrigation. This is uh, 74 uh, gallons a square foot annually. This is a heavily irrigated uh, site. Um, when we looked at the other mix, this was actually a very low irrigated site. Um, and we were thinking um, irrigation, you know, probably some failings of the irrigation system itself were leading to some of this, but it wasn't unprecedented low. Um, um, other areas, this is intentionally at 16 gallons. These are sort of more average numbers we were seeing at other um, sites. Um, so uh, less water was being used in, in, the, uh, in these soil types over time, whether that's from the failing of the irrigation or from um, just not really needing those um, because of the, the loam soil being able to absorb nutrients. Um, at, the, at the 2016 site, we also noticed that um, you know, there are already signs of irrigation failure happening um, in certain, we also noticed irrigation, these are an irrigation line, the trees are trying to like tear the lines out of the ground. I've never seen this before, but um, yeah, they, you know, the, the fact that, that the nine, you know, the 89 soil um, had already had irrigation failings is telling, and then you're going to probably see that here too. And that gets really expensive, you know, in 30 years, do you want to replace all of your irrigation system? You know, or do you want to like renovate your site? Um, you know, they're big cost tickets and not many people are excited to drop a money to tear out all your, 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 your irrigation systems. Um, also ir irregular water distribution. You know, this is 15 foot apart and one area was very dry. One area was very wet just after irrigation. And generally um, the soils are drying out after 30 minutes on a hot day. So completely dry in 30 minutes. So you need a lot of irrigation for this soil type. Um, we also looked at uh, some soil biology and the mycorrhizal uh, counts in these soils. So, you know, again, the 2016 soil, um, you know, did notice fungal spores were there. That was, that's, it was a good sign, a healthy amount. But what was interesting, you know, and also in the loam soil, they were very strong in the loam soil, um, you know, for uh, my fungal spores. Um, but the, the, the 1989 soil, that was the best. And, and we couldn't figure it out at first, but we realized that, you know, the trees are so stressed. <laughs> they're not, you know, they're, they're struggling. There's very low organic matter in these soils um, that they're actually relying on the soil biology to, to, to survive, um, essentially, is, is our sort of hypothesis on this. Um, otherwise, it, you know, it, it wouldn't, it doesn't really make sense. So we're still working through these, but um, these are the picture of those, those, those fungal spores. Um, there's actually a mite right there, but yeah, the rest of them are these beautiful little images. Um, so what we saw, um, the soil in the 2016, this sand mix, because of all the irrigation, you're seeing a lot of nutrient leaching. You're actually getting a lot of, um, of brown patch and problems with the turf. Um, and you're also seeing stress in the plants um, and the nutrients are sort of being leached through the soils uh, pretty quickly. The soil is very reliant on irrigation. Um, in the 1989 soil, we again saw that nutrient leaching, um, pretty much the, the compost had decomposed completely. Um, imagine when you're putting compost in soils, over time, that does not stay there, that actually decomposes. And um, how, so, when you're thinking about adding a lot of it, remember it's not permanent, it's just a temporary fix. So better to put that organic matter in the top of your soil profiles, not mixed into it. Um, um, but anyway, and then a loam soil that was you know, much more stable, lower irrigation usage in those loam soils. So can we specify these? 
there's there's resilience uh, to to a loam based soil system. Um, there's also you know nutri nutrient holding that's really valuable to those. Um, lower energy carbon offset. You're not mixing all these soils. You're not harvesting the sand. You're, you know you're actually just taking it from one spot and moving into another spot. Um, you know, and and there are ways to work with these soils. There's um, you know actually bridged paving. This is ways that you can literally just um, you, you install your soils and you just pour your slab right on top with some extra rebar in there. You don't over compact these soils. You you kind of compact them and say. 80%, but I think you can come back and insert anything really, and you'll be probably, um, you know, without going too high. And I say anything, I say, you know, 80% is fine. Um, so these are ways to keep continuous um, soil zones, um, root zones in your plantings for pretty inexpensive. There's obviously soil cells, which have been talked about a lot. These are really great for, you know, getting that uncompacted soil volume. Um, there's other ways of your own structure that you could actually have uh, suspended slabs. Um, part of the garage slab, so your cost kind of gets hidden into the garage budget. Um, this is actually a perforated uh, slab system where you have um, a suspended slab here, and then you can put porous papers on top. Sort of an example of what that looks like when you when you do this. The, the sort of water kind of goes through the joints, through the slab, into the soil volume beneath. And this is um, installing that that system, and we're literally putting the soils in, and then you know, all the way up to the top here and then just pouring the slab right on top of it. And we went, we talked to the geotechs and I'm saying, you know, what do we have to compact this soil to? You know, do we have to compact it to 85% if you're going to pour the slab directly on? Eventually it's going to be a suspended slab. So it's going to be completely, you know, su supported by the rebar in this system. But you um, have, let me make sure I'm going to chat. Jordan, you're going to jump in if I'm over time, I'm sure. Anyway, um, anyway so what the, what the geotech told us, he says, no, he's like, no, you, you compact that to 70%, you can pour your, your concrete right on top of that. And I said, well, what are we going to get from settlement? He says, about an eighth of an inch. And I said, really? I was like, I can compact these soils just lightly, you know, 70% or so, and pour a slab on top, and I'm not going to get a lot of settlement. And we did, and it worked. You know, we didn't get, we, you know, we saw about maybe an eighth of an inch, we were measuring, um, you know, maybe actually a half an inch in some areas, but that could have been something else. But you know, this was a way for us to get soils and pour directly on top of the, the soil. And it uh, worked really well to get low compacted, you know, soils beneath your paving. Um, how to source, protect, and install these types of soils. Um, you know, this is really a basic um, you know, tutorial on, on, Piedm on Piedmont soils. Jordan, about five minutes? What do we got? Uh, you it'd be great if you could wrap up right now. <laughs> right now. All right, soil sourcing, done, sorry. Um, just keep in mind in New York, you know, basically go go west of 95. That's the trick there. You don't want the sand soils. You want to really look at some of those better loam soils, uh, silt loam soils, et cetera. You can do this on your sites. Um, you just got to work on soil protection. And um, anyway, a lot of, lot of talking. And uh, let's get to the questions because I think there's going to be a lot of questions. Don't forget about the Urban Tree Foundation. We can get all these details. And uh, anyway, let's open it up to Q&A. What do you say, folks? I'll leave this slide here. Everyone jump back in. Thanks so much, Paul. Uh, thank you so much to all our speakers and we're excited to hear more from you right now. Uh, Nelson, are you there? Yes, I am. Great. So I'm gonna turn it over right now to Nelson Villarubia of uh, New York Trees and he is going to be our moderator for the discussion right now. So hopefully we can bring up some of the questions that people asked in the chat and maybe some um, catered questions of your own as well. Sure, great. I'm gonna give everyone a minute to start answering their, uh, putting in their questions now in the, the Q&A box. Uh, but to th kick things off, thank you, James and Tatiana and Paul for a great discussion. Uh, got a lot of things going about um, soils in New York City as well. and. Um, Using landscape architecture as urban renewal is becoming more popular, especially in post-industrial cities. Um, but one of the biggest barriers that I see in working with the community is their public perception on these soils and uh, they're afraid to interact with them or they're afraid to see these spaces change because they think of what their perception is with their soils. So I was wondering, um, and Tatiana, you brought this up at the 
tail end of your presentation on how landscape architects can work with the community to address these concerns. I'm assuming that's to you, Tatiana. <laughs> ah. <laughs> um, so uh, let me see if I understood you correctly. So are you asking um, how can landscape architects work with communities to kind of uh, re calibrate um, kind of the mental stigma or the social perception of what these um, hazardous soils are to communities. Is that kind of what you're asking? Yes, exactly. And, and the perception that they are hazardous, because in your presentation, you're talking about they're not always hazardous. But I think the perception of a lot of commun community members is urban soils equals hazardous soil. And I think we need to change that. So I'd like yeah, to I that. wholeheartedly agree. Um, I think, you know, at least in our line of work, the difficulty we find is that um, it's kind of like people love to go with the bad news. So you get a lot of sensationalism exactly where people are trying to actually help the community. They actually end up spreading false information about soils and um, the risk of their contaminants and the, the risk it poses to human health. But um, as I said before, soils are always acting as a buffer to human health. There is a lot of powerful geochemistry that's happening in there. Um, something that Paul mentioned and James, uh, Jim mentioned in their presentations. There's um, a whole seed of activity that happens not only on the soil texture and structure part of the soils, but in the microbiology of a soil. And I think um, some of the easiest ways I've found to relate it to people um, in community gardens and other places is that um, they really are no different from the human gut. So your body is always trying to save you from um, something you've ingested or some kind of contaminants that's affected your body and your gut microbiome is critical. So with landscape architecture, you're always working with the soils to feed it, to optimize its capacity to, to, to glorify or gloriate in the ecosystem they are developing in that landscape, landscape architectural design. Um, by that token, I think it's a pretty easy thing to relate to say, uh, look, the, we've worked with the soil systems to provide these uh, plants their best optimal soil health so that they can live through that. And I think if, um, if people can understand that there's an army of microbes surrounding every root of every plant, and they're the ones who basically say, yes, you're allowed to come into my system. No, you're not allowed to come into my system. So if the soil has a healthy alternative, it will never choose the bad alternative. And in the same token, it's uh, with organic matter and with proper soil structure and microbes, they're always kind of playing Pac-Man and they're absorbing or absorbing their contaminants. Very seldom does it come into a potential risk where that, so that contaminant is just kind of hanging around saying, next finger that touches the soil, I'm gonna bite it. You know, it's so, I think there's definitely a way to translate something into the, the code of beauty of what you create in a landscape architecture design, uh, the beauty is basically a picture of the restoration of the health that's going on. So there's much less risk to the human in that capacity. If you're, if the, so if the plants can survive, the human can survive. I know that's very plain, um, but I think it's a starting point for the conversation. It obviously is more complicated than that. And there are other risks involved, but um, on the get-go, I think that, you know, it's, there's a there's a critical need to translate that there's um, uh, always a buffer and resiliency happening in the soil and you know work as landscape architects working with the soil I think um, you have a very powerful message to to lay out to the communities that there's only hope and improvement to be had here not the other way around it's never the dead end street there I'm not sure how else I can possibly um, think about other translations, except for having workshops and helping people reach that education access point to understanding the soil's behavior and their behavior with plants is critical. So uh, there was a famous arborist in, in Washington who once said that the politics of trees is a lot more difficult than the science of trees. And I think you can translate that to soil, that the politics of soil is a lot more difficult than the, the 
the, the science of, of soil. Landscape architects need to become soil experts. And I'm not talking about needing, you need to go to, uh, um, you know, a, and become a soil scientist, but you need, it needs to roll off your tongue. Um, so I believe that neither Paul nor I, uh, I, don't, I don't know about Paul, but I never have had one course in soils. Um, yet I taught a graduate level course at Harvard on soils. So the, it, it's not rocket science, um, and, but it should fall off your tongue and you should be the, the um, essentially the ambassador for, for the soil. Um, the, the nasty one that we have to worry about is chemical contaminants. Um, I think that we need a lot of research on that. We know that trees um, and most plants or many plants are excellent uh, phytoremediators of lead, for example. Um, we need to figure out what that process is. Um, we need to make sure that our plants are healthy enough that there isn't uh, uh, exposed soil uh, near where children will be playing so they don't eat the dirt, um, which they will do. I know I did uh, when I was a kid um, and still probably do. Um, so that, that's a, a big, uh, you know, a big, a big concern uh, that we have to, to worry about. The last thing, um, um, and Tatiana, you, you, you use this and it, it, it kind of, I kind of twist, I'd like to twist it and that is native plants. <clears throat> we should not be trying to make the soils in New York usable by the, the plants that were native there in 1492. I think that's a big mistake. Uh, we need to grab um, Peter Del Tredici's book, The Wild Urban Plants, and we need to consider the, the plants that are native to New York right now. Um, and we need to make soils that will make them grow really well. It, the important thing is that the plants really grow. And it's not so important that they be native. Um, most of our plants are, that are not native are, are not going to uh, kill our cities, but dead plants are, are going to be difficult uh, to, to work in. I know I'll get some pushback on, on the native issue, but it, it's always bothered me. Um, uh, I, I'm working on a project in um, uh, Council Bluffs, Iowa, where the soil uh, expert created a spec that required that the soils on the site uh, be between six and 6.5. You're in the middle of the Great Plains. There isn't a, 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 a low pH soil anywhere within a thousand miles, maybe 500 miles. Um, so we should have make sure that the, the, the plant list for that project can tolerate uh, soils with a pH of 7.5 to eight. And, and there are plenty of plants that will survive at eight or even 8.5. So it's just a matter of finding those plants and, and, and making that your, your plant list. So yeah, and I, and I will, to the native plants comment, I will also say, you know, while I, I definitely agree we should support lots of different trees, I think there is also a role as stewards of the land. If you are, you know, a lot of our cities are built along waterways, are built along major, you know, migration corridors for birds and such that you are supporting you know migratory species with with native plants and, and native trees particularly where you can you know i'm not saying that's what you should only do but i think there is an opportunity to be be um, a steward to both local insect and bird populations with with native plants so i think there's a balance there i'm not saying do, you know do all male ailanthus or you know no male ailanthus i know jim you'd love to see them now. i love i love i know male you do ailanthus yeah i know not yeah. invasive and it's a fabulous tree yeah yeah it's Thanks. Okay. Um, if I can make one more comment, um, I love the fact that Jim, you mentioned um, soil isn't rocket science and it's totally not. And that's uh, one of the reasons why we created the Urban Soils Institute is to offer access to all resources about soils because it should not be um, you know, reserved to the people that have gone to school and studied them at all. Um, I think soils should be considered kind of like walking around in your own vessel, which is your own body. It's, it's always useful to understand at least a little bit. You don't have to become a doctor or a neurologist, but to understand the basic functions of your body helps you kind of be less scared about how it adapts and, and deals with uh, situations illnesses or, you know, poisons or whatever. And I think, um, put it in a nutshell, uh, when it comes to uh, the landscape architects being able to, to help translate that information to community person, I think um, 
exactly what Jim says, make that uh, knowledge about the basics of soils accessible. Because as soon as you understand how they work and how they live every day, how they sustain life, they scrub your air, they provide the plants that you eat, they, they filter water, they, uh, they, do, they filter everything. So um, if they literally put the shirt on your back and you start to understand the, just the basic functions of what makes them breathe and be alive and how they work for you and with you, then they'd seem less scary. And the contamination aspect seems less scary because people usually freak out about contamination because they don't know anything about it. But um, once you understand that there's uh, processes in the soils that are always counteracting it, and yes, sometimes we have to give it medicine, harness it and amend it to make it better. You know, sometimes your body does the same, but to, I think, uh, honestly, I think what you said is right. It's not rocket science and that information, it's a common resource like your air and your water. So everybody should know at least some basics about it. Then it doesn't seem as, you know, they're not waiting for the experts to tell them because honestly, the experts don't know a hell of a lot about urban soils. Right. And especially contractors <laughs> yes. you know, conveying to a contractor, you know, why you're doing this. And they're like, I've done it for 20 years this way. The best of the best is this way. And you say, well, here's why, you know, and then they kind of, oh, I get it. Thanks. You know, any questions, Jordan, or are we uh, just waiting for beer? What's Great. going on? No, I have a next question here for Jim. And uh, do all of your soil specifications get completely customized for each project, or is there a good starting point? Well, certainly the, the, the front end, the part, part one is pretty standard, whether you're in New York or Albuquerque. Um, the products change on every spec. Uh, we have to use a local uh, uh, products that we can get. Um, so we, you know, our, our, so our soil, our basic soil uh, construct and the specification needs to start. For, when I go to a new place, the first thing I do is call up the local soil suppliers and say, okay, what does your compost actually look like? What is your, um, what kind of sands? What is the pH of your sands? What are the, um, the, the kinds of soil that you can harvest and get? Um, and send me some soil, some soil test results. Um, and then from that, I build, I build the, the specification around that for, for each project. Um, um, I also uh, think that it's important to do, for us to do more soil analysis. Um, every, I believe every landscape architect should own a Dutch auger um, and go out to your site uh, on your first day there and spend an hour digging uh, four or five uh, holes um, taking some samples and finding those um, discontinuities that Tashiana described. Uh, we can use the plants that we see growing to tell us a lot about the soil. Um, uh, but we, we should be able to do a decent soil analysis. Um, I, I start always with that uh, soil, um, the USDA soils uh, site that Tashiana um, uh, uh, described. Um, and what, one of my uh, theses is about urban soils is that while, yeah, we move soil around, uh, prior to World War II, it was expensive and hard to move it very far. Um, and so while this, the soil survey may say that this you know, is typically an area that should be a silty loam, probably the soil that you're going to have there is going to be various kinds of silty loam. Uh, you're not going to find that we have dug, you know, hauled in a whole lot of stuff. In New York City, Maybe a different story, but you can still do your soil analysis, um, uh, and we should be able to do that. And, and it's it's not that hard. Uh, in my book, I describe the whole methodology on, on how to do that, um, and uh, we shouldn't have to hire somebody to do it. We should be able to. Somebody in the office should have enough smarts to be able to go out on site with a soil auger um, and use the, the web resources that are available and and say, okay, here's approximately what we have. Yeah, and get to know your local soil providers and, and, and where the sources are coming from or the soil providers in your region in, in the region of your project if you're working outside of your, your region. If you can specify them, that saves them a lot of time. <laughs> if you know what they're, what they're going to be able to provide in advance. Great. And speaking of resources, what books, et cetera, would you recommend to learn more about soils? Up by Roots. Uh, yeah, sh shameless promotion up by roots uh, takes a, a really quite different approach to uh, uh, the whole problem. I'm afraid because uh, up by roots was was 
uh, written and finished in 2008. Um, uh, there's a bit more about manufactured soils in there that I would care about. If I did a second edition, I'd probably take that whole section out and spend a lot more time on, on native soils and soil profile rebuilding. Although the picture that I showed you about soil profile rebuilding uh, was that is actually from Up by Roots. It was done before <clears throat> Susan did her, her study um, that essentially proved the concept, but we had already been, in 2008, we're already talking about uh, soil profile rebuilding. We just didn't have any science to, to prove that we could do it. Um, uh, but now, you know, that, that diagram is fully supportable with uh, some very good science. And the Urban Tree Foundation website as well, just for good specifications, as, as draft templates, as well as details um, that are really useful for, you know, and, and that was uh, Ed Gilman and Jim Urban and others worked on those. They're really terrific. Yeah, that's ur urbantree.org. There's nothing, nothing to do with me except I, I help them with it. Um, but it's a complete set of specifications in Word that is <clears throat> open source, so you can use it, you can change it, and 50 CAD details that you can slap on your drawings, um, ready to go um, for all manner of things, of soils, planting, uh, tree preservation. Um, uh, what was the, there's a fourth one in there somewhere. But it's, it's, it's a ton of data when you drop it, and it's free. I would also recommend The Nature and Property of Soils by Ray Weil. Um, so that book is really intense, but at the same time, you can pick out pieces. You don't have to read full chapters and you can kind of parse your way through there. But I mean, it gives you everything from the physical and chemical and microbiology properties of soils and you can go as dig, yes, exactly, <laughs> as you want or, or just use it as a reference Bible. But it's, it's a really good um, one that gives you all the literally the basic properties of soil. And, and, and he was my professor, good. Jim. I did take a soil <laughs> class, just so you know. Right. Very, very good. Yeah. Well, the nice thing about that book is that Ray got an incredible indexer and the, the index oh. on that thing is huge. That's, and that's you know, a big you have a, something you're looking for, you can find it in the index and get right to that part of the book. And yeah. a lot of the stuff that's in Up By Roots came out of Ray's book. I, yeah. I lifted where I felt it was necessary. And then we have um, the USI, the Urban Soils Institute, we have um, kind of like these basic uh, soils 101 and interpretation workshops, um, just to kind of get the ball rolling to get people into kind of a interactive atmosphere. So it's kind of an interactive way of learning with some hands on stuff. So, well, hands on virtually these days, but still. <laughs> Great, and someone wanted to know about how to get Jim's book. Uh, they were his students are having trouble getting it. Is it going to be reprinted? Um, as far as I know, it's still in in print. Um, uh, you can order it on ISA, and there are. Last time I checked, there were four or five uh, bookstores um, that carry it. I used to carry it in the house here and sell it, um, uh, but it got to be too much of uh, too much of like work actually. And uh, since bookstores were selling it, I thought I'd let them. All right, but uh, ISA I know still has it, and and I, I will check on that. Uh, and if not, I will will uh, beat some doors down and get it get it re reprinted. Yeah, and that's that's ISA dash arbor .com. So that's the International Society of Arbor Culture. Great. Well, thank you so much to all our panelists that we had here today. Um, if you look in the chat right now, or everyone watching, we have just posted the link to the happy hour that follows. Also earlier in the chat, Diane had posted the links to the evaluation form, as well as the quiz that you need to get your credits. Um, once again, I just wanna say a big thank you, Paul, Tatiana, James, Nelson, everyone, thank you for coming out, sharing your expertise. It was really inspiring to hear from a lot of you industry experts and, uh, I hope we can all work together and learn a lot more about soils in the future. For everyone who's going to be joining us. <laughs> thank you. For everyone who's going to be joining us in the happy hour, uh, we just ask that you sign on in maybe 10 minutes or so. We're going to get set up with our speaker from Other Half Brewery, and uh, we hope to have another great presentation for you all. Thank you so much, everyone. I'm going to leave this open for about 
four or five more minutes just to make sure everybody gets the link to the evaluation and the chat. So I'll leave it open for a couple more minutes. I'm sorry, the evaluation and the quiz. Thank you. Thank you for having us. This was great fun. Sure. Hope, to see, hope to see lots of faces at the happy hour. Right, not just ours. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Yes, the, the happy hour is a different format. We'll be able to see everybody's faces. Thank you all. Thank See you all in a bit. I'm going to give it just a minute so people can get the chat, uh, the quiz from the chat. 